Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You have just listened to Willing Up and Mathieu Polak on piano, and I think their music has uh, brought us, well, a little bit, no, not back, but to New York and to Broadway. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Monique Knappen, and uh, as director of the John Adams Institute, I'm very proud to open tonight's lecture, um, which is actually the first of a series, I think, which we will be organizing together with the University of Amsterdam. As you may know, the John Adams Institute is a non-profit independent foundation which promotes American culture in a very broad sense. We organize lectures with the best authors from the States, but we also invite influential Americans to share their field of expertise with us. We have welcomed so many great people, I can hardly begin to name them all. For a complete list, you should have a look at our website or take up a brochure in the, um, in the entrance hall. Tonight's event, which also is part of the Amsterdam lecture series, features an American speaker who has a special relation with Amsterdam. I'm happy, Geert Mock, um, who holds the Wiebout chair and works with the Amsterdam Study Center for the Metropolitan Environment, convinced me to invite tonight's guest speaker, John Mollenkopf, who is the author of Amsterdam Through New York Eyes. John will discuss immigration and integration, I think one of the major issues of our time. Before I ask Geert to introduce John and the panel members who will come later, I would like to thank him and the University of Amsterdam for cooperating with the John Adams Institute. I would also like to thank the construction company Dura Vermeer and the city of Amsterdam who have also helped us make this evening possible. Now I'm very proud to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Geert Mark. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to on this special occasion and a special welcome to our, for our, to our guests from New York, Susan Feinstein and John Mullenkopf. A few days ago, last Friday, the retiring dean of the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the well-known Hermann van der Wusten, gave his goodbye lecture on this same place. It was a very interesting lecture, especially because he turned our attention again to the historian and anthropologist Benedict Anderson and his brilliant study about nationalism under the title Imagined Communities. In this study, Anderson explained in which way national communities differ from other communities like families, neighborhoods, villages, and even cities. Normal communities have practical palpable roots, he argues, while national communities are communities built on faith, on a national leader, on a complex system of collective symbols, on shared views about history, on a certain idea about ourselves as a group, you can say that national communities are, are living in our heads, not on the street. A nation is, of course, a community, because it is always conceived as a deep, horizontal uh, comradeship. But on the other hand, it is also imagined, Anderson writes, because the members of even the smallest nations like, like Holland, never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or hear about them. So we live all, at least partly, within imagined communities, in Dutch bedachte gemeenschappen. Amsterdam is not a nation, but it is a big community. And only a few people, even, I think, in, within this audience, know the whole city really well. So, for the most of us, Amsterdam is also partly an imagined community. And 
We see in Holland and in Amsterdam what we will see now is an imagined community in disarray, especially these years. We, citizens of Amsterdam, we see our city as an open and tolerant city. That's a part of our collective imagination. But in fact, we are, of course, not. We are just normal human beings. We, the Dutch, we see our country as an overcrowded piece of land with where is no place so historical for immigrants we don't see our country as an immigrant country but in fact we are absorbing a lot of immigrants and that gives us that makes us confused the immigrants too had a long time especially the immigrants from morocco and turkey the same same imagination, also they lived in their own imagined community. Not, they said, of course we are not immigrants, uh, we live here only for a few years. Uh, this is a temporary situation, this is, that was their imagination. It was a kind of endlessly, endlessly delayed departure in which a lot of immigrants lived for a long time. So both parts of this city, the Dutch and a lot of the immigrants, have lived for years within, a, let's say, a collective myth. It was only temporary. It was not a real immigration. And the Dutch even projected everything on the new citizens. They projected their old host, uh, their old freedom, they said they were only guests people and they were accepted as guests. Then uh, they put a lot of immigrants out of the society. They started to talk about uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, they talk about uh, criminalization and so on and so on. And another part, on another part, they projected uh, yeah, you can say the Dutch history, especially the Dutch history of the Second World War. They were the victims, they were the new victims, they were the so-called asylum seekers. But it took a long, long, very long time before the Amsterdam citizens and the Dutch accepted what was really happening, uh, uh, a, a, a situation of immigration, and before they started to use this word. So, the discussion, and a lot more discussions, but especially discussions we will have tonight, these discussions are very important, especially at this moment, because they put us with our nose on the facts. And the fact is that we are living in the middle of a situation of immigration, and that is a it's a complex and painful process for every society and every city. It's only very interesting, complex, but also difficult. And the fact is too that we can learn a lot of other cities who have experienced this situation, of they experienced these problems already for a long time. And that we can be inspired by them. So it is with a great pleasure that I <coughs> can introduce you to tonight to Mr. John Mollenkopf, the director of the Center of Urban Research of the University of the City of New York. Mr. Mollenkopf, it is an honor to give you the floor. Heritage, it is very much of an honor to be here, and I thank you and the John Adams Institute and uh, my friends in the audience for having me once again to Amsterdam to talk about these issues. I'd particularly like to thank Willem Salet and the Amsterdam Study Center for the Metropolitan Environment for 
the uh, visiting scholarship that allowed me to begin to know Amsterdam in the summer of uh, 1998 and from which this talk stems, and also to Susan Feinstein for uh, introducing me to the AME. Let me begin my talk by sharing three vignettes uh, from my experience just over the last week uh, or two here in, in Amsterdam and in a few days leading up to my trip uh, in New York that I think capture certain aspects of the challenge of reconstituting urban citizenship in the face of all the global and transnational trends that are, that are reshaping our cities. The first concerns uh, someone I'll call Hislaine Nasser, a Moroccan student at the University of Amsterdam. She grew up in the southern part of the Netherlands. Her family was the first Moroccan family to uh, move into their neighborhood. So she grew up completely among uh, other Dutch students, learning the Dutch language. Uh, and yet she felt, and her family felt as she grew up, that she would not make it to university if she continued in the Dutch educational system. So her family sent her back to Morocco to go to the American school uh, in, in Morocco. And from there, she went to the University of Amsterdam and ultimately was an exchange student uh, in, New York, uh, in New York City. Um, and she had read the article um, that some of you might be familiar with that I had written and wanted to come talk to me about it. And the thing that she said was that in New York City, she was being taken for being a white person. Her skin was very fair, lighter than mine. Her hair was dark, like, like mine. Um, and people thought that perhaps she was an Italian-American. Um, and she wanted to say back to them, no, I'm not a white person, I'm a black person. I'm black too, because that is the way she had grown up in the Netherlands, thinking of herself as, as a black person. And the point, of course, is that race is a socially constructed category, and it can be internalized, and it comes out of a social context. The second um, vignette happened just the other day as I was riding the metro down to the Belmer to go to a Caribbean festival that was being held there. And after a stop or two on the metro, I was the only white person left on a train full of uh, black people, a car, car train full of black people. And that's a very familiar experience to me because the subway that I ride into Brooklyn ends up in black neighborhoods. And so I'm often the only white person on a car full of uh, West Indians, essentially. And there was a young, I think, Antillanian boy, about 15, he had a gold tooth, he had baggy pants, he was wearing a baseball cap slightly askew, um, seemed to have adopted various American ghetto uh, symbols, and he was, he was busy buying something to eat as the train was about to leave and his friends held the door for him uh, while he collected his piece of uh, his sandwich or whatever. Uh, and, you know, delaying the train from leaving, a another well-known New York City practice. Uh, and off we went, and somewhere along the line down to the Belmer, um, he, he was horsing around with his friends, and he, he took a bite out of the sandwich and, and chewed it for a second, and then spit it out on the floor uh, in an act that I thought was you know, not, not the kind of thing that I expected to see in the Netherlands. Uh, and he was clearly saying, I think, that um, I'm going to spit on you because you are spitting on me. And he, he had adopted what we, what academics in the United States all, often call an oppositional identity. Um, I guess that's, uh, academics like to invent fancy words for very plain practices sometimes. So I ended up in the Belmer, and the reason that I had gone was to hear um, a, a group of school children playing steel pans, um, which orig originated in Trinidad, um, but spread throughout other parts of the Caribbean, 
You've probably seen them and heard them. Parts of old 55-gallon oil drums that have been refitted as, as musical instruments. And a friend of mine had been teaching the children of the Belmer, kids who are 12 to 14 years old, uh, to play steel pan tunes on, on drums that she had imported from Trinidad. And in this band, uh, there were eight West Indian children, who I assume were mostly Surinamese, although I wasn't able to talk with them. There was one Pakistani girl, and there was one Dutch child. And it was interesting, the Dutch child, a boy of maybe 14, also you know, had a baseball cap on with the, you know, sort of twisted off to the side and baggy pants and uh, was basically able to relate to the West Indian kids in the same way that they related to each other. Uh, and I was surprised, you know, teenagers, early teenagers are not the easiest people to get to do anything in unison. And the band was very good. They had learned a number of complex tunes and played them well. And I started to te talk to their teacher who was there. Uh, and she said that she'd been teaching in a black school in the Belmer for quite a few years, uh, that she thought there were a lot of really smart kids in the school. Many of them aspired to be doctors and lawyers. Uh, and that she hoped many of them could be able to get to the university. But she was worried about the fact that they didn't have a lot of support from their parents. Only one mother of one child had come to see the children play. Uh, she was worried about as the boys got older, they would be attracted to the lure of the streets and um, you know the various kinds of things that adolescents boy, boys do to get into to trouble. Uh, and that and that many of them uh, might not make it. Uh, and she thought that she stressed to me that if they didn't make it, it wasn't because they weren't smart enough or at that age didn't want to uh, achieve very highly, but they faced long odds. So with these three context, uh, um, um, vignettes as context, um, let me launch into my talk, and I'll, I'll try to go through it quickly. Um, and it, it illustrates um, the, the degree to which you compare, can compare uh, New York and Am uh, Amsterdam. And this stems from my experience a few years ago uh, staying here for a while. And the basic argument that I've been developing, first of all, is that there are many reasons to think that Amsterdam ought to be a lot better than New York City at immigrating immigrants. Uh, and I'll explain the reasons in a second. But the evidence, and it's not all good evidence, because we need to do a lot more research on this question, but the evidence that is easily at hand indicates that this may not be so for the first generation and possibly also not for second generation immigrants. So I set out to try and reason out why this might be the case. And I came to the conclusion that the reasons stem not only from the condition and the situation of the immigrants, but from aspects of the Dutch welfare state. Now, why should Amsterdam be better? First of all, you don't have a tradition of domestic racism the way the United States does. Um, it seems hard for us to remember sometimes, but institutionalized racial discrimination was uh, legal in the United States up until about 35 years ago. So it's fairly recently that we've overcome, uh, even in a formal way, this tradition. We also have a far more unequal society. The Netherlands has much greater income equality, higher floor of social welfare, much more social housing. And in general, I think most Americans who are knowledgeable about the subject and perhaps from the middle of the road to the left where my American friends and I can be found, we think that the Netherlands is an example that the United States ought to emulate. Finally, as was uh, said by Herk Mark, 
The Netherlands and Amsterdam are committed to traditions of tolerance, consensus, and inclusion in a way that's just not characteristic of the United States or New York. We'd rather fight than um, cooperate with each other. And finally, you have strong national and local policies to promote immigrant incorporation. In the United States, uh, the federal government sets immigration policy, that is, who is allowed in, but it's completely failed to adopt an immigrant policy. It does very little for localities uh, to, to help them come to grips with the immigration that, that has arrived on our shores from national policy. Now, both the U.S. and the Netherlands have, as has been mentioned, a high degree of immigration. 10% of the American population is foreign-born at this point. And when you consider we're a nation of 285 million people, that's a very substantial number. And another tenth have at least one foreign-born parent, the, the, the second generation. In addition, American society is much more a, a society of minorities than I think the Netherlands is. Uh, blacks are about 13%. Latinos about the same. Uh, the Asian, Asians are smaller but rapidly growing. But taken together, roughly three out of ten uh, Americans are from a, a, a minority uh, background. And similarly, in the Netherlands, about 8.3 million uh, of your residents are foreign-born. That, of course, includes people from places like the United States and Germany and so on, and not just the third world. But a, a roughly 8.5% are first and second generation uh, ethnic minorities, and um, another two and a half percent or so from Indonesia. And similarly, New York and Amsterdam are both ports of entry for immigrants into our respective nations. Uh, both of our cities have large immigrant populations, uh, and these populations are growing, and they're extremely diverse. Um, looking at the national website of the Central uh, Bureau of Statistics for the Netherlands, listed about uh, 40 or 50 different countries from which there are substantial numbers of, of immigrants in the Netherlands. The second generation is a major challenge in both cities. The children of the immigrants are numerous. It's a growing group. It's a group that's also growing up. Uh, and, it, and it's a group that um, whose life trajectories, the success or failure of their life trajectories, will say a lot about the, the future of our two cities. There are some differences, of course. New York City is a majority minority city, and uh, we have immigrants from all racial backgrounds, not just minority racial backgrounds uh, in New York City. Um, this is sort of a rough estimate or a rough attempt to estimate the breakdown of the populations. You can see Amsterdam uh, still has a majority of, of native stock whites, that is, uh, Dutch people uh, who are not only born in the Netherlands, but who, whose parents were born in the Netherlands. That number in New York City is only one in five at this point. You wouldn't necessarily tell that from watching the TV shows that emanate from New York City, um, but New York City has long since uh, a city in which um, majorities, I mean, minorities of, of various kinds add up to uh, a substantial majority of the city. We also have more white immigrants uh, and children of white immigrants. There's a long tradition of uh, immigration from the mid-19th century of Irish and Germans. Well, I guess you could say the Dutch were the first immigrants to New York in the 17th century since they... Um, bought it from the Indians and established New York City. Um, but we had major waves of immigration from Europe in the mid part of the 19th century at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. And even after World War II, it displaced people from, uh, from, from Europe from the war. And we also have substantial uh, black and Latino populations. And I, I, not that this, the Amsterdam uh, counterparts here are exact equals, but I just, 
I put them on the chart to give you a sense of the dimensions. New York City, along with Los Angeles, are the two major nodes for immigration into the United States. And uh, taken together, the two metropolitan areas have 40% uh, of all the immigrants in the United States. So, so these are the, the, the major destination zones. Of course, migration affects the rest of the country as well, but it's extremely concentrated in these, these areas. Uh, and as I mentioned, the stream of Im immigration has been of every race, and we continue to get European migrants. In the 1990s alone, about 200,000 uh, residents of the former Soviet Union moved to New York City. And there are parts of Brooklyn, for example, where Russian has spoken in the shops, the signs are in Cyrillic, and you would think you might be in, in Kiev or something as you walk down the streets, as well as from many other places. And our mainstream institutions, our political parties, uh, our social service organizations, our churches, uh, the city government has been marked by this history of, in, of immigration. And interestingly, the civil rights movement created a set of institutions of incorporation for minorities that started out to serve African Americans primarily, and then secondarily Puerto Ricans, but have gone on, I think, to serve as avenues of upward mobility for new immigrant groups. Now, there's some reasons that we often worry about immigration in New York City. Since many immigrants are non-white, a huge Caribbean immigration, for example, which is black, uh, we, we worry that immigrants may be forced down into a kind of native-born uh, African-American underclass, or that, that discrimination will create immigrant ghettos that will have negative effects. Uh, of the sort that you sometimes talk about uh, here in, in, in Amsterdam. And deindustrialization has certainly reduced the number of low-skilled jobs that immigrants can take without having to have any facility with, with English. Um, there are plenty of low-skilled low jobs in New York City, but a lot of them are in the service sector that in, in, uh, require interaction with clients and therefore English facility. Uh, so the opportunity structure might be headed in a, in a um, unfavorable direction, at least theoretically. And as I mentioned, New York is a city of great extremes in income. Some of the wealthiest people in the world, or many of the wealthiest people of the world, as well as some people who are living in levels of destitution that would not be allowed in the Netherlands. But I think American society, and New York City in particular, have come, become more accepting of racial and ethnic difference over the past decades since the civil rights movement. Uh, and we, the, the first generation enclaves uh, in New York City, both in the labor market and in terms of residential neighborhoods, seem to be reasonably vibrant, reasonably positive, generating a kind of upward mobility, in some cases very dramatic upward mobility for their residents. Now, if we look at the similar picture in Amsterdam, Indonesians appear to have been assimilated. I know that's not a word that I'm supposed to use in this audience, but people do not break out uh, Indonesians as a separate category in the statistics. They don't talk about Ind Indonesians as a problematic category. There isn't an Indonesian ghetto to be pointed to. Uh, the closest thing, I guess, are concentrations of Indonesian restaurants that all of us tourists go to, go to eat in. And I think it's interesting that there is this, a successful case by all of, uh, appearances that is not discussed in comparison with other cases and why it is that this group succeeded if other groups are not. The guest worker generation of Turks and Moroccans, however, is in a quite different situation. And not to put too fine a point on it, I think you're maintaining the older uh, part of this generation uh, in a dependent situation through various aspects of the of welfare grant system as well as in inexpensive social housing. 
Um, and it seems that in between these two poles, the Cernonese and the Antillanians um, are showing some gains relative to the, the Turks and the Moroccans. But they remain fairly highly segregated, both residentially and in the school system. And the progress that is made is only relative to a position of fairly severe disadvantage, say, 10 years ago or 20, 20 years ago. And the gap is closing with the Dutch norm, um, but there's still quite a bit of the gap left to, to close. And although the studies of the second generation in Amsterdam and the Netherlands are, are just beginning and are more in the nature of case studies with very small uh, data sets, um, I, as I read the evidence from those studies, uh, in some cases it seems there may even be downward mobility in the second generation, especially among Moroccan kids and perhaps also uh, Turkish kids. Um, and that there remain very high levels of being out of the labor force for the second generation, especially where um, higher education has not been achieved. Now let's just look at the first generation labor force participation rates of different groups. These are New York City data from, from our National Survey of Labor Force Participation uh, for last year. And you can see that uh, overall, there are pretty high rates of labor force participation for males and females, the leftmost bars. And the foreign born total, the rightmost bar, is actually a little higher than the total. So all other things being equal, immigrants are, are more likely to be in the labor force than the native groups. Of course, native whites are the most likely to be in the labor force. And it's the native minorities, native blacks and Puerto Ricans, where labor force participation rates, particularly among men, are, are low. And Dominican immigrants are, are, are somewhat akin to the Puerto Ricans, but it's interesting that the Dominicans, as immigrants, are doing slightly better than uh, a native-born citizen population, Puerto Ricans, who've been in New York City two and, and even three generations. And you can see that the, the Chinese uh, and the West Indians are, are, you know, are doing quite well by this comparison. So here are equivalent figures for Amsterdam from the uh, web page of the, of the ONS. Uh, and you can see that the all ethnic minority bars on the right hand are substantially lower than the total on the left, and that the Dutch are very high, and it, it trends downward from there in the, in the direction that we've talked about. Uh, and that as we get to Turks and Moroccans, uh, less than half of the population has a job. And I'm sure if you cut that by age and looked at people over 40 or over 45, you would see much lower rates of labor force participation than that. Now let me say a few words about our second generation study in New York City that I've been working on with two colleagues over the past few years. We're studying in detail five second generation groups who are aged 18 to 32. These are the major uh, groups and some uh, interesting uh, contrasting groups. We're comparing them with native-born groups. I think this is very important to do in social research, not just to study immigrants in uh, isolation, but to see them in relationship to the rest of the population. And we did a telephone survey, in-depth, in-person surveys, and some ethnographies. Now, we found that the groups that are most like whites, Russians are, are white immigrants, and Chinese seem very rapidly headed towards being honorary whites in New York City, they're doing extremely well. In fact, the Chinese immigrants to New York City may set some kind of intergenerational upward mobility record uh, previously held by Jewish immigrants from the turn of the century. Uh, and it's, it's Latino groups that are doing worse, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Um, and there are 
I won't explain the reasons why I think this is happening, but it is interesting to people who think that African Americans may be the worst off group in the United States, that at least in New York, other, other groups are worse off than they are. Uh, West Indians, Native Blacks, and the South Americans are, are, are in between. And this pattern of group outcomes holds even after you control for some obvious uh, individual factors. Uh, and a net of all these various individual factors, the second generation is doing a little bit better than their native-born counterparts, which is, you know, which is very interesting and an important finding in the American literature, especially for those who were worried that the second generation would be downwardly mobile. This is just uh, the percentage of our, our groups in our sample that got a high school degree. It's a fairly low hurdle to get over because our high school isn't nearly as demanding as, as say, your gymnasium or, or lyceum. Uh, and some of these high schools are you know, rather modest in their standards. Yet a high school degree is a, a sort of minimum credential for attending higher education. Uh, and you can see that even the worst off group, a great majority of them have achieved a high, high school degree. That's the Puerto Ricans and that some of the immigrant groups have done quite well. Now, we also asked about what was going on in the lives of these second-generation immigrants, and we found that uh, they were interacting with each other far more than they were interacting with native whites. And since native whites only make up 20% of the population, and there are strong class differences between the groups, that's um, to be expected, I suppose. Um, but they're creating a kind of n a new kind of youth culture in New York City with, with all kinds of interesting hybrid characteristics uh, that, that make New York, I think, a very exciting and interesting place to visit, especially if you get off the, the beaten track. And compared to their parents, these young people are very American. They don't want to go back to Jamaica. When they do visit Jamaica, they say, eh, I couldn't possibly live here. They, they turn off the electricity at 6 p.m. You know, they, they don't want to be uh, oriented towards their home countries. At the same time, they're also uh, diff very different from the dominant white society that they see largely on, on television. Uh, they've created some kind of majority-minority uh, New York City-oriented youth culture. Now, in, in Amsterdam, there's very little data on the second generation. Uh, colleagues at INES, the Institute for the Study of Migration and Ethnicity here at the University of Amsterdam, are proposing a major study with Erasmus University's survey research unit that I think is extremely important. And if there are any uh, officials of funding agencies sitting in the audience, I strongly urge you to support this uh, the study that they want to do, which will which will produce uh, good good data. Um, but there are there are some sources of information uh, from various sorts places, and clearly uh, much lower rates of of getting the kind of uh, secondary school degree that is going to lead to a university education, or indeed uh, getting a university education. Persistently high levels of unemployment uh, and exclusion from the labor force uh, for some groups, especially those who haven't achieved higher levels of education. And as I said with my example from the, the metro train, young minority males are clearly adopting oppositional identities that um, upset uh, Dutch citizens. But from the American perspective, the relative success of the Surinamese is quite interesting because we think of, of blacks as being uh, subjected to the most blatant forms of racial discrimination and therefore most at risk. And levels of intermarriage between black immigrants and black natives and whites are much lower in the United States than is the level of intermarriage between Surinamese and uh, native Dutch people in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam. What little data I could find show, th this is the rate, um, the percentage of school-going uh, youngsters in Amsterdam who are in a school uh, giving the sort of degree that leads to university education. 
And you see, and, and of course, these are much more demanding and selective institutions than the high schools that I showed you from New York City earlier. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a very important um, hurdle to jump over if you want to get the kinds of positions in a post-industrial service economy that are going to you know, lead, lead to the sort of outcomes that we all wish for our children. And they're particularly low for Turks and uh, Moroccans. So, some tentative conclusions. I think our first generation is doing a lot better than yours, and primarily because it has, or is compelled to, uh, to work. We don't maintain large uh, bodies of adults in dependent situation in the United States. And if anything, our social policy is moving away from welfare support to work. Welfare reform, quote unquote, has limited the number of years a family can be on welfare to five. And localities like New York City are, even when they're granting welfare benefits, they're dividing the, the value of those benefits by the minimum wage and coming up with a number of hours that they require uh, welfare beneficiaries to work, cleaning up parks, cleaning up the streets, painting, painting benches in the parks and, and whatnot. So I'm not saying that this is an entirely uh, unalloyed good thing, but the fact is there's much more access to labor force participation among first-generation immigrants in New York than there is in Amsterdam. And I think that our second generation, although, as I indicated before, it's very much a variable picture, and it depends on many factors and the, and the uh, uh, endowment in cultural and, uh, and economic resources that groups are bringing with them and how they're perceived by the native population in New York City. But net of all these sort of complicated factors, I think that uh, at the end of the day, the evidence will show that our second generation is doing a bit better. Also, and I think primarily by having access to higher levels of, of education. Um, let me just say that I was visiting with a senior administrator of the University of Amsterdam who had just gotten the latest figures on the ethnic composition of the enrollment of the University of Amsterdam and said that taking all ethnic minorities, it was 8%, and if you looked at Moroccans, in Turks, it was only 4% of the student body. At the City University of New York, uh, immigrants make up well over half of our student body, and it's overwhelmingly minority. Now, the University of Amsterdam is a much better university than the City University of New York, uh, but nonetheless, I, th I think it's institutions like the City University that provide a sort of second chance for immigrants uh, to gain entry to professional occupations um, which are just much more difficult for them to enter uh, in this in, in your context. And if there's to be a comparison drawn, it's really not between immigrants and immigrants, first or second generation. It's between the way you classify immigrants as ethnic minorities and our minority populations in, in New York City. I think the school system in the Netherlands, uh, if the name of the game is what's going to happen to the second generation, then the crucial determinant of that seems to me to be the way the school system is playing a role in sorting and seg segregating uh, the second generation into different kinds of opportunity uh, trajectories. And I think that it's interesting in our case that affirmative action mechanisms that were created to help African Americans have taken on a new life, uh, a second life, if you will, with new uh, populations and are providing various kinds of uh, backdoor entry points to important institutions in, uh, in New York City. So if I'm to leave you with some thoughts about what sorts of policy debates you might have among yourselves, I, I really would leave you with two key points to ponder. Uh, the first is that it's dangerous, in my view, to systematically exclude groups from work when you define in your society, and we do in ours, uh, status by occupation. We talk about people as productive or unproductive. If they're not productive, then they're negatively stereotyped. And um, it's, 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 a kind, it's a recipe for difficulty. So I would say, how can Amsterdam open up more employment opportunities 
for ethnic minorities of the, especially the first generation. And um, New York has thrived, has really succeeded in the decades of the 1990s in considerable part by all the forms of, of immigrant enterprise, of, of business uh, startups that, and, and I'm not talking high tech here, I'm talking about uh, people who own, open up grocery stores and who will stay open in the middle of the night when other stores close, or people who will uh, work on reconstructing the old housing that we have in Brooklyn and do a better, faster, cheaper job than uh, a native contractor would. There, there are many uh, things in a, in a sort of um, service-oriented, consumer-oriented, uh, convenience-oriented society like, like New York City that, that immigrants can do. And um, you might think of ways to, to encourage immigrant enterprise. I would refer you also to the work of um, Jan Roth and, and others at Imez who have been taking a look at, at immigrant enterprise in the Netherlands. Second, I think that the relatively rigid educational stratification, both between black and white schools in the school system, the importance of the test that comes in the eighth year of primary school, uh, the fact that there aren't really backdoor entry points into higher education, these are all things that I think you need to take another look at. And you have to think about uh, how to create a, a second chance access to higher education. Um, I'll close with uh, a quote from my new friend Paul Skeffer's uh, article on this topic. He said, what we struggle with is a double integration deficit. Many migrants and their children lag behind, and at the same time, institutions like the media, the university, and the police are not open enough towards new talent. Um, I think those are extremely wise words, and I look forward to our discussion of them tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John Mollenkopf. I'm glad to introduce you to this panel. I, was, I may stress that also everybody in the audience can ask questions later on because this is an evening and we call literally, let's ask New York. Let's people, Amsterdam, ask the people from New York about their experiences. Uh, I will introduce you in short from the left of my sitting Susan Feinstein. She is Professor Urban Planning and Policy Development from the Rutgers University in New York and she has written on social inequality in New York, London and Amsterdam. She knows also Amsterdam very well. In far, at the far left of mine is sitting uh, Paul Schaeffer journalists. He's writing a lot about minorities, especially in the last two years. And at the other side of mine is sitting Jaap van der A, elder man of the city of Amsterdam, and he is responsible for education, youth, affair, youth affairs, and big problems in general in this city. <laughs> so, especially now. Uh, yeah, I would like to, to Ask my of John Mullenkopf. Well, I guess you're asking, do I agree with John? And John and I have had a long history of never wholly agreeing with each other, so I, I guess know that. So I've written about no exception. <laughs> uh, John said that. Um, New Yorkers are more accepting of difference and that immigrants in New York are doing better uh, than um, immigrants in Amsterdam. 
Uh, well, both of those are, are <laughs> phrases which are highly subjective and less hard to, um, to put to a very precise measurement. Uh, more accepting of difference perhaps is the case. And I think that uh, one of the real reasons why you have this difference in New York uh, is because we are all immigrants, that the United States is a settler society. Now, there have been periods of American history which have been highly nativist. Uh, we have what were called the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, until the 1970s. Uh, immigration from other countries was limited by which country it was. That is, uh, European immigrants were welcome. Immigrants from developing countries were not. And each country had a quota based on, I think it was the population in the United States in 1920, uh, the proportion of the population. Uh, however, there's been a great liberalization of the immigration laws, and there's a great deal of pro-immigrant sentiment, uh, which comes out of this sort of belief by natives and immigrants alike in what's been called the American dream. So the idea that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, you make it on your own, that there's a lot of upward mobility, uh, is a widely shared sentiment, which leads to an admiration of newcomers who are thought to be trying very hard. But this is why I question the they're doing better part of the phrase. Uh, doing better by being in the labor force, yes, but being in the labor force in very highly exploited positions often. Uh, there was a book by Ivan Light and Edna Bonacek on Korean uh, immigrant entrepreneurs in California, not New York, uh, but the situation in New York is similar. What it pointed to was the very high level of exploitation uh, that they extracted from themselves if they were self-employed and from their workers. Uh, in New York, there's been considerable friction lately between Korean grocers, who are a very upwardly mobile group, and their workers, who are almost all Mexican, and who have been seeking to form unions, uh, which have been very strongly opposed by their employers. We're talking about people, many of whom are in fact illegal immigrants, who have wages of $2 an hour, let's say five guilders an hour, who work 70, 80 hours a week. Is that in fact doing better? Uh, if you look at life expectancies and health status, and of course the fact that we do not have any universal health insurance, uh, that uh, one does not find that immigrants are doing better. Uh, so I guess, uh, without taking up too much time, uh, what I would say is that uh, doing better is in the mind of the beholder and that uh, it is in fact perhaps the case that many immigrants in the United States would regard themselves as doing better because they have work and they see a chance for their children, uh, but they may not be doing better as measured by income, health status, uh, and housing. Okay, thank you. So we'll find that. Paul Schiffer. What I learned um, to tell it uh, in the first instance and then to ask um, some questions, but what I learned is first of all, and that goes against some of the wisdom which is upheld here most by politicians, is that the first generation still matters. And not only because those who are here, but also those who are going to come to the Netherlands. Because the simple statistical fact is, which you would never hear, or which is not stressed enough in my feeling, is that in 20 years' time, the first generation will still outnumber the second generation. So if you speak about migrants coming from outside of the European Union area, uh, estimations give that in 2015 about 1.3 million immigrants from the first generation will be in the Netherlands and about 1 million uh, will be second generation. So the whole idea which was born out of a gesture of uh, tolerance to write off the first generation to say well this is a terrible um, unfortunate coincidence that they came with a certain motive 
uh, and, it, and that soon afterwards with the restructuring of in industries, high unemployment. It's the whole idea, if you look at the statistics, I think the picture is, um, especially for Turkish and Moroccan men above 40, you have um, rates of labor participation somewhere between 30, 35 percent. I think if you would project this on a longer range um, towards the attitude towards the first generation, that would be really not a good thing. That is my first lesson I drew. The second one is with the uh, second generation, which is often put in the center of all the attention with the idea that there will be a sort of um, dynamic at work and sort of more or less spontaneous dynamic of improvement from one generation to the other, of those children who are born here, and it definitely shows that there is an improvement that can't be denied compared to the first generation. But if one looks at the schooling systems and the process of segregation which are at work there, I think it is not something to be simply accepted as a given, and I think too much of that is now accepted with the argument we have a free choice schooling system and we should simply um, abide with what is happening in the city. I think it's much more complex given the effects. If you look at it, 90% uh, now, which shows in statistics, of Turkish and Moroccan children get stuck in the lower levels of higher education, of the secondary high school. So, um, VMBO, VBMO, and um, MAVO, which impedes very much their chances um, in further life, and which, given the quantity of migration in a city like Amsterdam, has negative consequences for the city as a whole. It's not only a question of specific groups being impeded in their upward mobility, but it gives, given the fact that half of the population is migrant or will be migrant, gives you an idea of the future economic and educational possibilities of the city at large. So there is a new dependence. It's not a question of minorities being helped or being emancipated, but it's a question of the city as a whole. So these are the two lessons. Now, two Other questions. questions. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. So my first question is, isn't, isn't one of the explanations that we still, in the Netherlands, have very little experience with classical immigration? The two groups that came, uh, Geert stressed it, have a completely different motivation. They didn't come to the Netherlands, either the guest workers or uh, refugees, they didn't come to the Netherlands to become part of this society, to play an active role as a citizen, to identify with this country with the idea we're going to spend our lives here, but it was always with the idea this is a temporary situation. So this is my first question, doesn't that explain a lot of the differences? The second uh, question is whether you see something in the United States which could be comparable with what I can see at least in the area of the Un European Union but definitely also in the Netherlands, that there is um, in the population a continuing majority arguing we have already enough migrants. And that's so that what you see is a growing uh, disparity between on the one hand what seems to be an economic necessity of ongoing labor migration given the demographic uh, developments in Europe, and on the other hand a declining cultural acceptance and is there something of this discrepancy to be seen in uh, the United States? Last question is, would we say now we are an immigrant uh, society, we are an immigrant nation? I don't think we really know what it means to say it, but we repeat it. Our minister now officially has declared that we are what we think we are, but nevertheless don't completely understand what it means. So, wouldn't it mean, if you say you're an immigrant society, that you ask something, ask something in the field of, let's say, some basic uh, things like language, uh, some sense of knowledge of the legal system, some sense of knowledge of the political institutions, things like that. If you ask something, you can get an answer. I think we didn't ask too much because we weren't interested in an answer. But still, and isn't it a good idea if you say and you continue 
to think about continuous migration, that you learn something from this practice in the United States, which seems to indicate uh, that people who arrive in the United States have a higher sense of identification. Second generation, I think uh, uh, the research of Ensinger uh, showed that, that the second generation still largely identified with the country of origin. What we heard is that the second generation is much more American. And I don't want, you know, to, there I end, to promote a sense of loyalty towards Dutch society, which I don't have myself. But I w would like to see a sort of minimum identification and what can be done to reinforce that out of the knowledge that this sense of identification helps and doesn't impede. Thank you. Mr. Molenkopf. I believe it was, is, it, is this on? Yes. yes. I believe it was one of the uh, German chancellors who said at one point that Germany asked to get guest workers, but human beings came instead. That, you know, a population can migrate for, for work reasons, but it's, it's unrealistic to uh, suspect that, uh, you know, they'll just pack up and pick up and, and go back home. So that, that even when a, a society uh, in, invites guest workers, it has to prepare itself for a long-term process of, uh, of integration. Um, in terms of the tension between the ongoing uh, majority's opposition to immigration and the underlying economic rationale for it, uh, um, I agree that, that that's a tension that's pervasive throughout Europe and is also pervasive in the United States. Uh, I think opinion polls in the U.S. would show something very similar to what they show in Europe, that roughly two-thirds of the people would say, we have too many immigrants already, let's not have any more. Also, I think public opinion in the United States thinks that most immigrants are illegal when, in fact, uh, they're not. They're, uh, they're legal. And I, I think it's quite uh, understandable that a long-settled, long-established population that thinks of itself as having defined the culture and being hegemonic within the culture would begin to uh, be upset when it seems that that cultural position is being eroded by people who are very different and who don't necessarily want to adopt your, your cultural ways, who have their own, and, and not only that, who become uh, in a collection of differences, uh, the majority, so that your what was dominant culture in the past just seems to be one voice uh, among many. I think that's an, an inevitably unsettling and, uh, and difficult process for the people who are going through it. In New York City, I think whites are well through that. Um, they, they stopped being a majority decades ago, and uh, they know that they are in charge of the, all the important institutions. Um, so I think it's not so important to them that they no longer control public culture, what goes on in public spaces or, or even popular culture. They just, they tune into different radio stations. Uh, so, so that I think that even though the sentiment against migration is understandable and inevitable, that it's not going to carry the day, that the, the, the gradient between the advanced, the living standard in the advanced societies and the living standard in the nearby uh, less developed countries is simply too steep that people will, from those less developed countries will try to climb over the boundaries and barriers whatever way they can. So um, I, I think immigration is an unstoppable force in the world today, as well as um, potentially a source of great dynamism for the receiving countries if it's managed appropriately. And, and those who have taken a careful look at it, um, and, and this is not to necessarily disagree with Susan's um, demurral from, from the points that I was making. Be, be, you know, it's, it's tough to make it in New York. Nobody has an easy road of it. Many of the jobs that immigrants work and succeed at are, are crummy jobs, and, and they get those jobs because native people wouldn't take them, don't want to take them. 
Um, so I'm not trying to glamorize or glorify the type of work that immigrants do in New York City. Uh, at the same time, they are economically productive. They have contributed in many ways to the city. Many, many neighborhoods have been revitalized by the energies of immigrant communities. And, um, you know, if any of you are coming to New York and want some advice uh, about, you know, neighborhoods you could walk around to see this happening for yourselves, just email me and I'd be glad to, you know, tell you which subway stop to go uh, and, and walk around. Um, so, so I would say on the whole that the, the economic logic of migration is going to overwhelm the cultural uh, dissonance that it, that it creates. Mr. Van der Aar. <laughs> Mr. Van der Aar. Men the man from... The exactly, the man on the hotspot. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of questions you have? I see you're writing. <laughs> Yeah, may I have a few remarks? And questions too. Questions too? No, maybe. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to stress that I agree with Mr. Molenkov, the uh, essential problem with our system. Uh, we have uh, old vanished, uh, we have an old vanished um, welfare system, old vanished, it's from the 60s, and uh, The situation in Amsterdam and Holland has differed uh, enormously in the last 30, 40 years. And our education, educational system uh, is, always, is also is true what he told about it. It's, it's uh, imp um, improves of if it causes uh, segregation. Uh, so we have a lot to do here. And the data he showed, Mr. Molokov showed, Um, are real, I, I'm, uh, I'm afraid, um, and we have to learn. To have, we have to learn a lot. But I have a few remarks. Or there are a lot of differences between uh, New York and Amsterdam, and uh, I'd like to stress too that for Amsterdam and for the Netherlands, the situation is a very uh, has a very young history. Uh, in the 60s, when I grew up. Um, There were a few Indonesian people, few uh, relatively, of course, but Moroccan, uh, Turks, uh, Suriname, we didn't know them. We, uh, and, and then came the guest workers in Holland, and now we say it was not very clever to think that they all should go back to their countries after a few years. But in that time, it was a very natural thinking of the immigrant, immigrant people. And as a, as a matter of fact, the, all the people from the south of Europe went back after 10 years. So the theory was not idiot. It was, it was rather real, but not for the Moroccan and the Turks people. And so uh, I was a teacher and a director of a big school in Amsterdam uh, myself for a couple of years. Uh, and I, I remember quite well uh, when the first uh, Moroccan and Turkish people, young people, came into the school. And it was uh, surprising, it was really surprising. And nobody had any idea what to do with those children. Um, And I, I think, up to now, the institutions are not uh, enough accommodated to that new groups. And that I agree. But to have a clear view of the real data, I think uh, the data Mr. Molenkov showed are not enough. For because of we have such a short history, it's not enough to view the static statistics, but you have also to view how they develop, what we call in physics and uh, math mathematics the derivative. And I have experienced it myself, the first years in the HAVO and VWO, there were no Moroccan and no Turkish children. They all went to MAVO and, uh, and uh, VBO. But Ten years later, it was quite different, and now it's much more different again. 
And I thought, as the sheets Mr. Molokov projected, that in the, edu the educational data were from 95, 96. And I, I'm quite sure that in the last five years, the situation had, has improved much. So, I agree that we have to learn a lot. We have, we have to accommodate our system into a much more flexible system, accommodated to the new groups. That is, that's for the educational system, for the social service system. And we had last month a very heavy debate in our uh, local uh, community, in our local um, council. Uh, about that question, for it. so it's very actual for us. But uh, this data, as Ms. Molokov showed, must be relative to a bit, I suppose. And maybe is my question for Mr. Molokov: Has he any further data more <laughs> satisfying me? I clearly have to improve my Dutch language skills if I'm going to ferret out better information from the from the Dutch bureaucracies. And I'm surprised that uh, <laughs> Elderman van der uh, can't do can't uh, can't do a better can't do a better job. I, I could I think that these statistics are collected uh, because they've been published at a certain point. Um, but they seem not to be published, at least in a place that I can find, on a regular basis. I'm prepared to believe that there is uh, significant improvement, although I'm sure that the improvement varies across groups. And the, uh, the data on change over time that I've seen sh does show that second generation uh, members born in the Netherlands uh, do better than first-generation people born uh, abroad who are, you know, the same age. And uh, there do seem to be some indications that over time uh, the matter is uh, improving somewhat, uh, probably most for the Surinamese and least for the Moroccans, uh, and the Turks are probably more towards the Moroccans than uh, towards the Surinamese. So, I mean, interesting from an American perspective, as I said before, that a, a group that we, we would think of as black is relatively uh, upwardly uh, mobile compared to people that we would think of as, as whites. I mean, Turkish immigrants in New York City are, are considered to be, you know, like, like Europeans um, and, and not like uh, somebody from, uh, you know, a... a an African, a society dominated by African uh, ancestry people. Um, so I think the whole question of, of confronting uh, a European Islam and finding an Islamic way to be Dutch and, uh, you know, reconciling those differences that appear to be relatively different in, in, in some way than the differences between uh, someone from Suriname who was a Dutch uh, subject and, and is now a Dutch citizen and spoke the Dutch language and went to Dutch schools and, and churches and so on, that seems not so problematic compared, compared to the others. And it's, you know, it's a major challenge. It's not, uh, you know, an easy thing to overcome, I think. Well, could I, I, I failed to comment on one of Paul's earlier questions of, uh, what should what should the Netherlands ask of? And I wasn't sure, quite sure if it was of immigrants what they should learn to be Dutch, or whether it was of the Netherlands what minimum standards should they set for immigrants to become incorporated, or perhaps both. But it does seem to me that acquiring facility in the Dutch language is a sine qua non for. Uh, integration. I'm not sure what the Dutch budget for uh, Dutch as a second language is. I'm not sure how easy it is for people to acquire these skills. I'm told by people who work in black schools that um, they're sort of slow to acquire Dutch and there's, there's a fairly high level of language retention of, of the mother tongue in these groups. 
Uh, in, the, in, the, in New York, uh, there's fairly rapid loss of mother tongues and acquisition of English. And for example, most of the Chinese second generation can understand Chinese and speak a little bit of it, but they can't read it and write it. And it's quite likely, I think, that as they grow up, they, you know, they probably won't acquire more Chinese facility and, and the language may be lost for the third generation, for their, for their children. And considering that the Chinese are a third of the global population or whatever, that's probably uh, our loss, actually. Before I give the word to, to the audience, I have, also, in myself, is also a question burning. Could be, to Mr. Molenkov, could it be that one of the problems, too, is that the Dutch society which seems easygoing and open, is in fact rather complicated to integrate, more complicated than the New York and the American society. It struck me when you, you in your, your lecture, you said the Indonesians was a, very, a case of very successful integration. You, talked, you used the word assimilation. The Indonesians came in the 50s, in the time when Holland was indeed still a rather, let's say, it was not a nice society, but it was a, a rather clear society. And Holland has changed very much in these 50 years. And in my impression, Holland is more an exotic society than, than a lot of other societies. Uh, how do you think about that? I mean, especially well, the, you know, the, not the countryside of Holland, but the cities. <laughs> yeah. the, the Netherlands yeah, the does, Netherlands. you know, have a reputation of for tolerating all kinds of difference in others, and not not necessarily wanting to oppose the Dutch way of of doing things on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, not necessarily being very accessible to outsiders. Um, I've had many conversations with. Uh, Americans who are part of binational couples uh, here in mm -hmm. Amsterdam who, who talk, who, who tell interesting stories about, you know, the long and winding roads they've, they've taken to become somewhat integrated into mm -hmm. Dutch society. And these are, of course, you know, highly educated, highly successful people with everything going for them. Yes. So you can imagine how difficult it would be for somebody um, who, who lacks those Yeah, it assets. comes from a village from in Africa. Yeah. Um, the audience, who can I give the floor? There are microphones. Please talk into the microphones, if possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, being Moroccan, I feel uh, compelled to say a couple of things uh, tonight. Thank you very much for a very interesting speech. Um, it seems to me that the question that's, uh, uh, that has been asked, why is New York really faring be better than, uh, than Amsterdam, that Paul Schaeffer had said something en passant, and I don't think that everybody has heard what he said, which can shed some light on it. He said, I cannot expect for them, from them, it's Moroccans like me, more loyalty than I myself feel towards Holland. And I think this is the crux of the matter. I have, I have, uh, I, I won't be long, don't, don't be afraid. Okay. Uh, I have, I have a, a cousin. Not for me. Okay, I have a cousin who is also Moroccan, Hissam, and who lives in New York. And his address is fantastic because he lives in 10 Downing Street, but in Greenwich Village, New York. <laughs> um, and there is difference, you see, uh, last year I went back to Morocco and Isam was also there and we were sitting in the garden of his father, father's house. He was proud of being an American because America is great. And Amer Americans say, say every day, I don't know if intellectual Americans do, do that, but Americans say every day how great America is. Whereas in Holland, the last thing you do is say something great about them. <laughs> That's true. Just to give you a couple of examples, which I always quote, just two examples. One, who were the, the, the first Nobel Prize winners in, in physics and chemistry in history? You take four of them, the three were Dutch. 
Who was the first Nobel Prize in economics? Tim Berchen, Dutch guy. Who, is, who, who are the only two brothers who got Nobel Prize? One was Tim Berchen and Nico Tim Berchen, his brother. The third Tim Berchen should have got Nobel Prize, but he killed himself, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the thing. I'll tell you, and, uh, just to finish, just another detail. I was in... I should mention crime for so he said. <laughs> just one last thing. I was in France... <laughs> just just, one last thing. I was, I was in France in 19, uh, 19, uh, 1989, and they were commemorating the bicentenaire de la Révolution Française. And everybody was, everything was always, uh, was, uh, had started, obviously, in 1789. Then Mrs. Thatcher said something like, wait a minute, we had the Bill of Rights in 1688. So actually it started with us. So the French was furious, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher was very happy about that, and there was a quiver. You know, when I came to Holland, this guy, I came to Holland 10 years ago, and I was reading once a book of the history on Holland, and discovered that there's something called placard from Latin that almost no Dutch people know, except obviously people like Hedmark. That actually the placard of Latin was the first document which established the, the rights of, of, the, of the citizens. And it was used by the Americans to write their, their own uh, constitution of the Clarissa of Defense, something like that. You never hear a Dutch guy say something about So if you want to integrate uh, Moroccans, Turks, whatever, please give them a horn that you can be proud of and be loyal to Holland instead of saying, oh, well, I'm not loyal to Holland. Why should we expect Moroccans or Turks to be? Yes, please, do be loyal to Holland. Can I get? What have we had was remarks there? Hi, yeah, I'm an American. I've been here ten years, and I uh, grew up in New York and in Boston and in Connecticut. First thing I realized as a white person here that the white people here, if you're not white, you're not Dutch. You're from someplace else. In America, if you're not white, you're American. You have to, here you have to prove that you're Dutch. In America, you don't have to prove that you're not an American or that you are an American if you're not white. And I think there's a big difference between uh, the two cultures in that respect. And I think it also is a very, homo it's a very uh, homogeneous culture here. So uh, the idea within the white culture that I grew up in the suburbs of New York is that we have the Irish, the Italian, the Catholic, the Czech, the Polish, everything. We're all talking about where we come from. But here you don't talk about that. So, because everybody's already from here. So, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a bigger wall actually for the non-whites to um, be accepted as Dutch. As in America, the concept that you're American is already given to you when you walk on American soil. As, as, a, as an immigrant or as a non-white person, actually. Thank you very much. No, there's, no, there's another yeah. mic. It's easier. I think I can make a synthesis between the, the last two remarks. The Dutch are proud of themselves. Love. The Dutch are proud of themselves. I mean, most uh, the, 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 uh, but as an ethnic group and not as a, a, a country of laws, a nation of laws uh, like the Americans, and if you're proud of yourself as a, con as a country of laws, it's uh, far easier for um, immigrants uh, to integrate, I think. The well, the Dutch... Uh, are not a people of lawyers. They uh, see themselves as highly pragmatic. Um, the law, and America is from the start, as the top view wrote, a country of lawyers, and they take the Bill of Rights and things like that very seriously. Thank you very much. On the, yeah, on the first day. Yeah, that is, your room. Yeah. Over here. My name is Peter Sagar. 
Uh, I have a question uh, both to uh, Jan van der Aar and Paul Schaffer. And it goes a little bit back to an intriguing remark uh, Gert Mark started with to say we live with a myth that people are here temporarily. And probably that has been ingrained in our whole system, in our bureaucracy, uh, a sort of that short vrijblijvendheid for those immigrants. And Paul asked the question to uh, John van what should we ask those people? But I now ask back to Paul and to uh, Jan van der A. Should we be more restrictive to those people? Today was announced by Mr. van Boxtel that 60% of the immigrants who take up the special courses in Dutch are dropouts after a few weeks. And he now is going to propose to, uh, to levy a sort of guarantee sum and when they finish it, they get it back. But probably those are the measures we are now thinking about. Do you uh, uh, think that it's a good idea? And from another perspective, yeah, it's more from the uh, municipal uh, uh, strategy, I would say, Paul Schaeffer from a more cultural uh, point. It's the idea we ask New York, but okay. <laughs> well, um, there are these differ about that subject, but here in Amsterdam we have, uh, we, we are rather restrictive also to newcomers and, for example, for the uh, language courses, we have uh, results of about 60-70% uh, achieving the examinations. Uh, but, uh, I th so I think we have to do our job good and that's not everywhere, of, uh, everywhere the same in Holland. But indeed, um, I think, it's my opinion, that uh, from the history of the, six, the 70s and the 80s, the tolerance was spreading out in the Netherlands, uh, beginning in Amsterdam. We have still now make a moving back to more uh, putting limits, uh, be more restrictive also to schoolers and pupils. Um, but uh, only being restrictive is not enough. And therefore, I agree very much with your neighbor when he said, uh, when he said that schoolers and people here has to be proud about themselves, and everybody has to be proud about themselves. And if we continue in Holland to look at minorities as problem groups, who we are uh, willing to help, then they will never get their developing changes they have the right to. And so I try, with developing my diversity policy here in Amsterdam, uh, to change the view and to say now we have to be proud about ourselves and about us, about the community and every member of that community. And as long as we don't recognize that, we introduce our prob problems ourselves. Paul Schiffer, short, please. Yes. Um, I think the, the question can't be answered um, by looking only at the question of multicultural society. I mean, it defines Dutch society as a, in general terms, our enormous staggering figures of uh, people deemed to be unable to work, one million almost. I mean, that is a general question asked to Dutch society, and particularly in the context of uh, migration, works out very badly. It's an open invitation to self-exclusion all the time. So that's the first thing. And the second one would be that um, I don't know the exact figures of, about Amsterdam, about these courses of um, uh, given to uh, people who are newly arriving here. <coughs> What I understood is that 40% drops out. But at least uh, what happens is that people get a contract. They have to <coughs> sign it, you know, it's an obligation. And then when they drop out, nothing happens. But while signing the contract, it is told to them that there will be a sanction to not completing the course. Now, there are many faults in the design of the course. So, I mean, it's not a question of who is to blame. But one can see what is offered is a contract and what is told after two or three months is contracts aren't that important, which I think on the whole is not a wise thing to do. 
a third short remark to uh, Fort Laoui. Um, when I said, I said, not more loyalty than I have towards Dutch society. So I was criticized by asking too much, you know, by instilling too, or insisting too much on national identity and the like. That's why I used the word no more loyalty than I have. What I meet is often in debates is that people start by declaring, I am loyal to the minority I belong to because, you know, we are in a vulnerable position and I can't afford too much self-criticism. Now, I think it would be very unwise if the reaction would be that I would declare I'm loyal to Dutch society or to Dutch culture. I'm very critical towards it. I still have a basic identification with it, but still I think it doesn't exclude a wide margin of critical and self-critical remarks. And my hope is that in the longer run, and I think people like you um, demonstrate, the need of individual voices who are critical and self-critical also towards, let's say, their own uh, communities, and that the pluralism which is shown and which makes everybody more vulnerable makes the distances in Dutch society smaller and not bigger. And so the conclusion would be that our culture of conflict avoidance has too much turned into a general culture of avoidance, which um, makes people prisoner, I think, of their own history and doesn't invite them very much to transcend their own boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to an individual voice there. I don't, I don't know whether I'm seen as an individual voice, but I will try to do that. My name is Fatima Elatik. I'm a member of the City Council of Amsterdam for the Partij van Arbeid, also known as the Labour Party in English. Um, I was sitting here just listening and thinking, well, oh, this is a discussion that's probably about me, because seeing that I'm a second generation, how do you call me, migrant Moroccan um, woman, because we have a lot of labels, so I, sometimes I just get mixed up about what kind of label should I put on my head today. But I, what I wanted to say, what I think is essential, I think Fouad tried to emphasize on uh, the, the identity of our Dutch culture that we try to bring to people as being uh, a part of Dutch citizenship. What I wanted to say is I think we have a little word in our dictionary that has become a sick world. It's called tolerance. We say in Holland we tolerate everybody, but when we talk about tolerance, we explain tolerance as being I accept you as long as you, as you um, live your life to my standards. And I think tolerance means I accept you, although you differ from me, I totally accept you because we live in a democratic society. What we see happening right now in this society is that although people seem integrated, and by integration I mean they have a, a social economical position that sometimes is much higher, much better than the native white uh, population of the society. Although they have established a kind of a career that people can look up to, they're still seen as a member of a community. They're still seen as a member of a group that needs to be integrated. And this is the kind of, um, um, uh, how do you call it? Paternalistic, no, but it's patronizing. It's a patronizing way of making policy because you say, come on, be a part of our great society, become Dutch, integrate. But what happens when those people come to this society and say, okay, I'll integrate, I'll be a part of this society, this is my city, I'm born and raised here, I probably will die here. But I have some kind of my identity that I need to, be, I need to see in this society. Is there a discussion? And then I wanted to just make a small remark to the gentleman over there that says, well, the difference between us and the States is we don't have like a, a national ethnic identity as Dutch, but we have an identity of laws. That's exactly what the problem is, seeing that we have an identity that is, we, we talk about, about our Dutch identity as being an identity of laws. That's exactly why we have these problems, because a conflict doesn't mean that we have that it's, it's the end of the world. A conflict can also mean that we can come together and decide what, are, what, it, what is going to be the identity of our country that I'm a part of, and especially you are a part of. And this is a discussion that we cannot um, just see from the point of view of um, 
how you say that, of organizing our society in a way of how we as the white superior group of people that lead our country can see that, but as how as we as a whole community could do that. And this is the, the biggest um, challenge that we face. <laughs> Sorry, because I've been translating all day. The biggest challenge we face, and I don't, uh, it's, it's good we have a theoretic view on migration and situation of ethnic minorities. We know that. We know how second generation, first ge generations act in the society. But why don't we talk about the real issues that we see, the problems we have? And I, I, I stress this out to Paul Scheffers, of course, because he's the author of multicultural drama. And um, I would like to tell you, because you wrote multicultural, multicultural drama about one year ago, one year and a half ago. And I, I've spoke to you a couple of times since then, and I know you've learned a lot about the real drama and where it is. And I would really like you to emphasize what is the real drama you have seen? Is the drama within the sorry, groups, this, this or is, is the drama sorry. within the people that finally see the groups getting their places in society? May I ask the, direct, the, quest, the direction of the questions? This is not an inner Dutch debate. We can debate the whole summer and the whole winter among each other. Now we have a few people from New York here. Hey? especially fluent <laughs> to ask questions. Please, I think you're... Do you have also a question? I, I would like to make a point. We, we have a few open yeah. council seats in New York City. I think you should come and run for one of them. <laughs> but, but serious, do you have a question to our American guest? Last question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Molenkop, how would you make the school system less exclusive without lowering standards? Because, as you said, that is a problem in New York, in the States, the, the, the high school standards are low. Well, that's, that's something that we wrestle with continually in the city, uh, University of New York, because we're, we're constantly attacked for having too low standards, admitting people who are not qualified simply because they are underrepresented minorities and therefore giving them degrees that are not worth the paper that they're written on. And I think we've, tr we've tried to take this challenge seriously within the City University and increase our standards without abandoning our traditional mission to provide access to excellence for people who are who uh, don't have the opportunity to go to college at more prestigious private universities. And I don't, think, I don't think there's an easy answer because it's a problem that begins in childhood in the home and can sort of cascade all along the life cycle and, you know, can break out at, at any moment. Somebody can seem to be making good progress uh, up until a certain point of their life and then Get in, get in trouble and get get derailed and and thrown out and and have a very difficult time making their way back. But in the stories that we've heard from our respondents, it seems like some groups, like whites, uh, and to a certain extent the Chinese, have family and group resources that allow them to absorb the damage uh, that 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 often comes in the risks of of an urban life and to and to rally and to get a second chance. And the exact same kinds of events in the lives of, of immigrant minorities have a much more permanent and damaging consequences like, like getting arrested and therefore never being able to get a job again, where a, a white person can get arrested and their uncle's on the police force and you know somehow the record is, is sanitized after, after a while. And that's why I think about uh, the idea of a second chance mechanism. Uh, I think the, the notion that we can protect everyone successfully from the risks of growing up in a difficult urban world is naive, utopian. Uh, those risks are pervasive and, and they will influence the lives of a certain number of people. So the real question is how do we help people to recover from the bad things that are going to happen to them? Do we give them a second chance? Um, the senior official of the university that I was speaking with the other day 
uh, was saying that um, until the recent past, a certain number of the better performing students in the, uh, and I'm going to, you know, hatchet this Hochschule. I, well, I tried anyway. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, that they could transfer into the University of Amsterdam through some, you know, fairly direct mechanism, but that some policy change had happened to prevent that in the, you know, in service of raising standards. Well, uh, you've shut a door instead of opening a door. I would like to think about mechanisms for opening doors. Um, uh, somebody, I mean, and I've come up with a number of things just sort of spun off the top of my head when people have been asking me this question, and um, none of these ideas are, are any more than half-baked. But what about a summer program that would recruit the top students uh, from all the black schools in Amsterdam that would be uh, some sort of internship where people would work you know, three days a week in some sort of agency, and they might have a special seminar on, on a fourth day, and on the fifth day they would work on some collective project, which might be a youth plan for Amsterdam, or just anything that they felt like cooking up. And then the graduates of these summer programs would uh, become noticed, they'd become people with more contacts than they had before, uh, people who would have some resources uh, to navigate around the obstacles that are inevitably going to. But you can think of many better ideas than I can, so I would say, you know, do some brainstorming and try some things out and see if they work. Thank you, John Mullenkop. You're running out of time, so uh, it's a pity. Uh, I, I can only give the word now to Mrs. Feinstein, because we are too late already, we can talk the whole evening and it becomes more and more interesting. Mrs. Feinstein, what is your impression about questions, remarks about this evening? I really get the last word? Yes. The last yes. Word. <laughs> well, I guess one of the things that struck me very much was this discussion of whether the Dutch are or are not proud. Actually, my impression when coming here, and I've been here many times, is that Dutch people are very proud of their country, of their inheritance, particularly of the Golden Age, which is frequently referred to as if it only ended <laughs> yesterday. Uh, so perhaps more of pride in culture than in um, laws. I think there's also actually enormous pride in the Dutch welfare state and in the high standards of, for example, labor regulation, and that in a way this meets with the question about schools, that there's a there is an issue of standards and the feeling of we have standards, we're proud of our standards, and we aren't going to change our standards for anyone. But that that leads to not seeing the way in which what are seen as high standards may in fact be discriminatory. <coughs> uh, one of the things I was wondering about, and, and certainly none of the data we have would tell you and would depend on, on survey research, but do the most recent immigrants to Amsterdam have different attitudes and different reasons why they've come here uh, than the older generation of immigrants? And does that make a difference in terms of their process of integrating into Dutch society? I don't quite know why some group of Africans ends up in New York as opposed to Holland, and that uh, it may very well have to be with purely accidental factors having to do with which quota uh, you managed to fit into. Uh, but it, I think it is the case that immigrants come to America with a desire to make it there, make it in New York, if you make it anywhere, as the song goes. <laughs> and I'm not sure if they come here with that attitude or whether, in fact, the whole very Dutch idea of you may be ambitious, but you're not supposed to show it, you're not supposed to stick your head above the crowd, doesn't somehow act as something of a pall on immigrant ambition and keep people from uh, having the kind of aggressiveness, perhaps, uh, which in, has its less attractive side in New York, uh, but which also is something which perhaps does assist people in fighting their way out of situations of, uh, of prejudice. 
Uh, one last comment I might make about the discussion on education. My, our son teaches in a school system in Maryland which is almost entirely non-white, uh, but which consists of Native American blacks and of many immigrant blacks, primarily from the Caribbean. And he finds that immigrants really do pretty well and that the kinds of school problems they have may have to do with certain aspects of their cultural background or language skills, uh, but that they do try hard and that eventually they do reach a standard. Uh, and so much of it has to do with these, these issues that have been brought up here of motivation on the part of both the receiving country and the people who are going there and become difficult, I think very difficult to tackle simply through policy. Thank you very much, Mrs. Feinstein. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I want now to invite Mrs. Monique Knappen. Well, thank you all. Um, I will keep it short, but um, I want to thank you, John, for your lecture. I want to thank um, um, all of uh, the panel members. I want to thank Susan Feinstein here at Paul. Yeah, from the uh, Joel Monikop. I think the, the debate was quite lively and interesting, also thanks to you. I learned a great many, and I think uh, we all did. There was some news and good in contra contrasting points and viewpoints, too, I think. Well, this was our last lecture of the season. This was a co-organized lecture, as uh, you found out. And we will take uh, a little break, but uh, we will... Uh, come back on the 5th of September with uh, a literary lecture uh, done by uh, Michael Chabon. He is the Pulitzer Prize winner. And uh, I hope uh, I will see you all then. It's a different topi uh, topic and different subjects. But if you're interested in the John Adams Institute, um, you can pick up a brochure in uh, the interns again and um, you can sign up to be a donor or a sponsor or a friend. And thank you very much for being here tonight. And have a safe trip home. Hope to see you soon. Thank you all.